Right, we're going to bring Alex O'Connor in next. And we're going to get down with abolishing the monarchy. Hey, Alex, how's it going? Good evening, Sean, if I may. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Whereabouts are you? I'm, I, I, I realize I look a bit like I'm in limbo at the moment. I'm in a, <laughs> I'm in a hotel room somewhere in North London. I just recorded a podcast and uh, my guest very kindly lent me the room to not have to rush back in order to do this. So, uh, and where are you from originally? Oh, uh, I'm from Oxford originally. Uh, okay. But, you know, I'm, I'm sort of all over, all over the UK. I, I sort of, I, I lug a suitcase full of camera equipment on, onto trains and halfway across the country to record podcasts because I haven't invested in a video guy yet. So, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> well, that's dedication. Thank you, Jojo. What got you into being an anti-monarchist? Now, there's a question. Um, I, I want to say nothing. I, I hate to disappoint in a way by saying that I don't care that much about the monarchy in that I, I wouldn't sort of, uh, I wouldn't put it on my gravestone, you know, Republican or, or sort of abolitionist or something like that. It just so happens that when the Queen died, uh, I realized that I'd made a lot of videos about a lot of things. I'm a YouTuber by trade. That's what I do for your listeners. Um, and now more of a podcaster, but I'd never made a video talking about the monarchy. And just as a point of, I guess, philosophical interest, I thought it might be worth doing at some point. And the queen died. And I began to get a little bit annoyed at how I couldn't seem to walk an inch anywhere in central London without seeing some morbid black and white picture of the queen and how I couldn't turn on a news channel to discover anything other then the fact that Charles is shaking another hand. Uh, William had a really cute interaction with a baby, something of this sort. Meanwhile, people are you know, drowning in floods somewhere halfway across the world. And this is relegated to a, a small footnote on the, on the TV screen. And so I thought, OK, it's time to, time to say something. So I made a video called Why the Monarchy Should Have Died with the Queen. And that was that. It was only a year later during the coronation that uh, the Piers Morgan show uh, reached out to have me on, which I agreed to because why not? Um, I think it was Gore Vidal who said that one should never turn down an opportunity to have sex or appear on television. So in that spirit, <laughs> I stood up and I, I, I did my piece and there it was. Uh, but again, that was just because I was invited. It's not like I would have sort of maybe made another video about it. And so I did clip it up and I posted it on my channel and whatnot. But it, it's not something that I particularly care about, except on principle. Uh, there are many things I care about on principle that I wouldn't make a song and dance about, you know. Did Piers get you a hotel room, or did he make you scurry back? <laughs> no, Piers. Uh, Piers wasn't quite so quite so accommodating. <laughs> All right. So for the viewers, then, you know, could you just expand on what is an anti-monarchist? What What do you represent? Well, um, to be clear, I really only represent myself. But my position on the matter is that. Monarchy, it seems to me, uh, is on the face of it quite ridiculous. Now, that's not quite an argument for its abolition, but I think most people can at least understand what I mean when I say that it's a bit of a ludicrous institution. This is the first time that we've seen a coronation in HD on television. You know, we've seen one before in black and white when it was still a little bit sort of mystifying. You didn't really feel like you were there in the room. What we've seen now is sort of a high definition of a man like Charles who we're used to seeing wearing a suit and a shirt, walking around just like any other politician or something of the sort. Suddenly we see this picture of him in these great robes, holding this bizarre orb and a staff. And you look at an image like that. And it, it, it's as if, it, to me, it, it strikes me in exactly the same way as if Rishi Sunak did it. If Rishi Sunak took a picture in those ridiculous garments, I could do nothing but laugh. That's how I... That's how I view what's going on here with, with Charles. And all of this pomp and ceremony that people say is the sort of the selling point of the monarchy in the first place. This is what it provides the country. I think for the first time in, you know, hundreds of years, people are beginning to see it not as this really cool, magical element of British culture that sits above the sort of dreary politics of the rest of the country, but just as a bit of a, a ludicrous extension of uh, inheritable wealth. That's, that's, that's on its own 
if you don't then add on the fact that we're talking about a political office that still relies on hereditary uh, hereditary possession of political office. This, in any other context, most people see as something of a, of, of a travesty, as, a, as, a, as an insult to the principles of democracy that otherwise ostensibly are integral to our country. Um, I think it's probably bad optics that taxpayer money was being used to fund this ridiculous ceremony, parading this homo sapiens around the country as if he has some divine right to rule over the rest of us during a cost of living crisis. I don't think that's great optics. I also think that young people in this country, if there's one thing they care about more than anything else, it's something like social justice. It's something like racial, sexual equality, this kind of stuff. So the fact that the Equalities Act of 2010 mm -hmm. is specifically designed to exempt the monarch from being uh, from being beholden to it. That is, if you work for the king and experience racial or sexist discrimination, it is impossible for you to make a claim to the courts that that's what's happened. Bad optics too. There are so many things about this family that, that just, if, if they just sort of existed and did their thing, you know, no problem, I don't care. I'm not trying to, you know, demolish Buckingham, Buckingham Palace. I'm just trying to tax its inhabitants and divest them of their political power. I hear what you're saying. We shouldn't be having the most expensive fancy dress party in the history of the decade in the face of all this wealth inequality and people suffering and more serious, far more serious causes that need to be funded. We've got a question here from one of the viewers for you, A Nexus. If the monarchy is abolished, who or what orgs could support all the various charities, foundations, schools, Commonwealth et al.? that the monarchy brings attention and donations towards? Well, if the royal family want to continue making those charitable donations, then they can do so once they don't have any political power. And in fact, I think that if the presumption is that they would stop doing so if they were no longer uh, holding political office, I think we can begin to sort of see through the so-called charity that we're talking about here. I, I don't know why, I mean, I'm not asking, I, I'm not saying that we should take their money away. I'm saying that we should, we should tax them. I mean, their monarch is immune from inheritance tax didn't pay a penny on the 650 million pound estate that he just inherited from his late mother uh, also immune from paying uh, income tax now the monarch has chosen uh, voluntarily to pay income tax since I think like the 90s but why should this be a choice is, is the question I would ask so in that sense I want to take some money from them but then that money goes to the government and if they want to sort of invest that into any kind of organizations or charitable schemes and they're welcome to do so I'm not asking to take away the the wealth of the family and they're welcome to uh, continue spending that in any way that they see fit and i want to know if you think a constitutional republic with a 10-year president or something would be a better alternative no i think uh something like i don't know maybe like a, a parliamentary system we could have something like the the leader of the government um sort of drawn from the from the legislative party that gets the most votes in parliament, you know, something like that. I'm not saying that I have an ideal political system in place. We don't even need a presidency. We already have a political system that can survive perfectly well on its own without a monarchy. If you don't think that's an ideal polit political system, then fine, maybe you prefer a presidency. Maybe you prefer a more American separation of powers kind of thing. Sure, but we already live in a country that is not governed meaningfully politically by the monarchy. The sort of power they have is a, is a, is a, is essentially a vestige. That's why I say I don't care that much, because although they do have this weird political influence, the kind of thing we're talking about is, is like self-serving. We're talking about like uh, tax exemptions, legal exemptions. We're talking about influence over the prime minister, this kind of thing. If, if, if the monarchy goes, nothing else would have to change. Next question is from Aurora Kida. If the British public ever did decide to abolish the monarchy, what is the process? Well, it, as, as I just said, I mean, I, I don't know literally what the process would be, because interestingly, I mean, for instance, if, if it required the passing of a bill into law, the monarch would, as it stands, kind of have to sign off on that, which would lead to an interesting paradox of the monarchy, uh, of, of the monarch sort of signing out of existence his own, his own power. Um, I think it would be a case of just considering them to be private citizens. They no longer represent the country in international affairs. Uh, they no longer have the political uh, powers, the tax exemption 
the legal mm -hmm. exemptions that I've just referred to, there would be some, uh, there would be some, um, slightly more minor changes, such as you know the the, the reference to various organisations as HM, you know, armed forces or whatever. But these are sort of minor cosmetic changes, if you like. I don't think it would actually require that much of a of a, of a, of a change at all. I also just want to say, I, ju I just thought uh, uh, on the previous question about sort of would a, would a sort of president be better? The implication when that question is asked oftentimes is that, yeah, but if we don't have a monarchy, we end up with something like, you know, we end up with a Trump or a Biden. We end up with a sort of uh, uh, a head of state who, who, who nobody likes. Like we've had Queen Elizabeth who for all intents and purposes, has been a good monarch. Now, I'm told that one of the reasons that she's been such a good monarch is essentially because she didn't really do anything. She never really let us know what her views were. She never really stepped out of line. She never tried to have any serious political influence, although some people say maybe over Brexit, whatever. Like, I think that says a lot as it is to say that she was such a good monarch because she basically didn't do anything. But remember that this isn't guaranteed. I mean, you say, well, what if, I mean, you prefer like a, a presidency where, well, you know, what if we end up with a Trump or a Biden. Well, if we end up with a Trump or a Biden, then at the next election, we vote them out. What do we do if we end up with a Trump or a Biden as our unelected head of state who can only be ousted by death? Then I think we're in for a, for a bit more of a difficult time. So, I, you know, I, I, that is to say, I'm not going to suggest that by getting rid of the monarchy, we're going to have a perfect political system and that our head of state is going to be a, a sort of a wonderful politician with the interests of the country and its citizens at heart. But there's no guarantee that an unelected head of state is going to be that either, perhaps even less so. So what impact do you think Meghan Markle and Prince Harry have had on the reputation of the royals? <laughs> uh, it's, it's hard to say, partly because I'm so uninterested in the affairs of Harry and Meghan. I'm still not entirely sure of all of the details of what it is that everybody likes to talk about surrounding them. Um, but I, I must say it's quite interesting given that we often hear the monarchy described as having a purpose of sitting above politics. It sort of removes all of the sort of the infighting and the debate and the drama and allows us to have this sort of elegant system that sits above our heads. It's like, are you so sure about that? When the, all the press seems to be able to talk about when it comes to the monarchy is Harry and Meghan. I think what it has done, if anything, is probably demonstrated what everybody already knew, which is that these are just ordinary human beings with ordinary problems, ordinary dramas, and ordinary family affairs. And the fact that for so long they've managed to suppress this is probably the result of A, an incredibly repressive tradition within the family, and B, the lack of sort of mainstream uh, rolling news coverage. And also the monarchy is losing its grip over the media. It used to be the case that, you know, if you want to publish a, a headline, the the owner of the newspaper would sort of check upstairs, you know, they, they'd call up their royal correspondent and make sure it's okay to run the title because they don't want to sort of be committed to committing some form of treason. That's just not really the case anymore. People say what they want, they talk about it on Twitter. And, and, and when you open the family up to that level of scrutiny, what are you going to find? Uh, you're just going to find a sort of aristocratic family who bicker with each other. That's, that's what we've seen. And, and so I think the influence that that has is telling people that these aren't actually uh, that special of a collection of human beings. Judith would like to get you to comment on the following. I can put up with a constitutional monarchy if that is what we have, but we don't. In a CM, there is only one role, the monarch. There is no role for a royal family, which is an artificial construct. Uh, I mean, yeah, a constitutional monarchy is, a, is, a, is an odd concept altogether. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand sort of the, the thrust of the question. Um, you can put up with the constitutional monarchy if that's what we have, but we don't have a constitutional monarchy. I, don't, I guess it depends how you define constitutional monarchy, but it is true that the monarchy is essentially a, uh, a symbolic um, you know, myth at the, at the basis of, of our nation. Uh, it's just unfortunately a, a myth that nobody believes in anymore. Um, I, I, I think I agree that the monarchy basically doesn't do anything. I, I'm told that the great paradox is that the monarchy doesn't have any illegitimate political power because it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't have any power anymore, you know? Like, they stop complaining about their influence when they essentially just sit above it all and don't really do very much. And then when I suggest that we should get rid of them for that reason, I'm told that they're somehow integral to our constitutional monarchy. But I agree with the questioner that that is clearly on the evidence of the first point that people often make, not the case. 
Next question is from Verity. Why not everyone become self-responsible and be their own rulers? We have an anarchist among us. Um, <laughs> fine. If, if that's, the, if that's the political system that you're after, then I have no quarrel with you taking that view. I suppose be careful what you wish for. Um, I think everyone is their own rulers in a, in a, in a, in a strict sense, but I, I, I must say I'm a fan of some kind of political organization and authority, but Maybe that um, maybe that's just a point of political disagreement that isn't strictly relevant to monarchy. So I'm seeing even in the comments there's quite a divide between the views your the views you're expressing. Um, why do you think there is a divide, and is is there a, a generational divide? Is there a, does America view it differently from the UK? Is there a geopolitical divide? Um, what's your perception of that? Hard to say about the American point because, of course, there's a there's an, the sense in which you want to be able to say, well, an American looks upon the British monarchy and thinks it's ridiculous because they're a sort of democratic country. But because it's a bit alien, they I think a lot of Americans see it as quite quaint, enjoy it. They think it's a a, a, a fun institution. And I think that people who really like the monarchy in this country don't have much more than that. It's sort of like, look, it's it's kind of nice, it's quaint, it brings the country together, it's very British, it's sort of part of our identity. Okay, so is, you know, Harry Kane, the captain of the England football team. I don't think that means that he should have the right to claim rulership over me by uh, hereditary principle. That's the thing that I have the trouble with. If you see anyone in the comments who likes to justify that, then I'd like to hear from them. I'm just going to ask the chat then, if you would like to see the monarchy in the UK abolished, put a one in the chat. If you'd like the monarchy to continue on, put a two in the chat. Let's see what comes in on that quick poll right now. And so the money then, if, if, if we got rid of the monarchy then, you said you wouldn't, take, you wouldn't liquidate them and put that back to, to good use. You would let them keep it? Uh, it's a, this is a kind of, it's a difficult question for me to answer because I'm not particularly well versed on the ins and outs of who owns which particular properties, where that ownership sort of comes from, this kind of thing. I'm not entirely sure. I, I don't want to, I think it would be a, a harder case to make if we were just kind of sort of try and make them live in a council flat or something like, like you know, keep the, keep the wealth, keep, keep the houses fine. But when you pass on that house, I just want to tax them for it. Um, I mean, presumably they still hold a significant cultural role, but they're going to do that anyway. Uh, I, I mean, we're essentially talking about celebrity here. Monarchy is maybe just the old, oldest form of celebrity. It's just a sort of uh, celebrity that has often had a monopoly of power to go along with it. But our current monarchy doesn't even have that, because I think if the monarch tried to command the armed forces to go against the will of parliament, for example, we'd be in for a, a sort of minor revolution. Uh, and so now what you only really have left is the celebrity. And that's essentially what I think they'll remain afterwards. So companies, you know, pride themselves on their brand. They invest massive amounts of money into the brand. Isn't the royal family brand UK? And it just reminds people of, you know, the complete history of the country and national pride what, what about that side of the argument if it does it's a pretty sorry brand if you ask me i mean <laughs> I, i'm not sure that's what people think about when they, they think of britishness and if they and if they do then it's not about the family themselves like we're often told that like yeah there's something about this family that represents britishness when people think of britain they think of like big ben they think of like you know the london eye they think of fish and chips like some people think of like the queen sipping tea but they don't think of like you know the head of state being the queen. They think of the kind of person that the queen sort of represents. I mean, even now that she's dead, people probably think of the queen when they think of Britain rather than thinking of Charles, which just goes to show that we're, we're dealing with a sort of symbolic celebrity here. We're not dealing with people actually consider, considering what it means to be a monarch. Buckingham Palace is still going to be there. You can still go and visit it. People often tell me that the monarchy is essential to this country because of the tourism funds. You know, aren't they essentially paying for themselves? Look. Nobody's going to stop coming to Buckingham Palace just because they think the Queen isn't there. I mean, when, when I was, um, when the coronation was happening, 
I messaged a friend of mine. I texted him and I said, oh, are you going to the coronation tomorrow? Are you going to go and walk around? I might go and see what, what's, what's going on. And he said, oh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm on holiday actually at the moment. I'm in France. And I said to him, that's astonishing to me. I don't understand how that country has any touristic uh, interest from people when they don't have an unelected head of state. I've been told constantly over the past week that the only way that we can apparently attract tourists to this country, uh, attract tourists to this country, is to have an unelected head of state. Why the hell are you in France? It's ludicrous. It's doing pretty well. People didn't stop going to the Palace of Versailles because it no longer has a king or a queen living in it. And the same thing's true of Buckingham Palace. Cheshire Zoo is a is a larger is a is a bigger tourist attraction in the UK than Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle. Brings in tons of money. To the UK economy. I wouldn't therefore be in favour of a state-funded ceremony for some ceremonial opening of its new chimpanzee exhibit. Jake has asked, don't you think the Queen was an excellent role model? I, I, honestly, I'm not sure. I mean, what what is it that she's done that's so great? Like, what, what is it that, like, I, I, that's not to say she's a bad role model or a bad person or anything of the sort. Like, she... She fine. I mean, if you if you look up to people who just sort of sit around, give bland speeches, and don't really do anything other than shaking people's hands and waving from a balcony, then I'm sure she's a great role model. And and that sounds unfair and almost a bit insulting, but that that's what I mean to say is that I'm told that what made her so good was that she was so sort of hands off. I don't see that as particularly inspirational. I think that lots of people are great role models. I think that you know sports people, uh, musicians, actors, they can all be great role models. That's got nothing to do with the question of whether they should be uh, in any kind of political office. Not to say that that's what you suggested, but that's the point that I would make in response to what you say. Wonderwood Mum. I think the royal family brand will be much better if they wipe the slate cl clean and crown William as king, Kate as queen. Do you, what do you think of that? Well, what that would do is dem would demonstrate immediately the arbitrariness of the hereditary principle that if you don't particularly like this king, ah, we're just going to skip it and move on to the next. You know, you could do one better than that. You could say, well, if you don't like this king and you're looking for an alternative, yeah, we could consider William, but why not consider a bunch of other people and, I don't know, take some kind of poll of the electorate to see who they prefer. Maybe the one who gets the most pu public support can become the new head of state. Wouldn't that be a novel idea? All right, so... With the issues we've had with our recent heads of state, why would abolishing the monarchy be a good strategic move? Presumably, the question means heads of government, because the head of, we've only had two heads of state in my lifetime, and one of them is Charles. Um, look, uh, I raised the question earlier. Firstly, does having this unelected head of state in any way change those problems. I mean, we, we say something, the question is something like, like, look at all the problems that we have with our heads of government. Look at, look at our Boris Johnson, look at all these scandals. Isn't it good that we have a monarchy? Why? What difference does it make? Are these scandals still not scandals? Are they still not damaging to the reputation of the country? Are they still not politically disastrous? What difference does it make if when somebody goes abroad to meet the president of France to shake their hand, it happens to be somebody else? Everybody, know who, everybody already knows who's really running the country. I don't think that changes anything. And what happens if that weren't the case, if it were the case that the head of state does actually make a difference, what happens when the royal family gives birth to somebody that you don't like? Maybe you like them even less than you like Boris Johnson or Liz Truss. What do you do then? Question from Matthew Steeples, which ties into what you just said. Would Mr. O'Connor rather we have someone like the orange-faced um, Donald Trump or the sleepy Joe Biden in place of the monarchy? This is a question that comes up all the time. I think we've, we've been asked it about three times just on this half-hour show. The answer yep. is yes, because when you get one, you can get rid of them just as easily. Try doing that with a monarch who goes a bit off the rails. Do you think there's something innate in human nature and perhaps even animal nature? You know, you've got like the queen bee that whereby people form around monarchs, kings, queens, and it's just something that instinctively we do. Yeah, almost certainly. Um, there's, there's, there are many aspects of our human nature which 
firstly come out in politics, but sometimes politics is designed to try to get around. I mean, the, the basic Hobbesian principle is that human nature is one of, sort of violence and competition, that we invent a political system purposefully in order to avoid. And if somebody said something like, well, don't you think it's sort of innate to human nature to be a bit tribalistic and be a bit sort of violent? And I'd say, yes, that's true, but that's no argument in favor of us designing our political systems to reflect that. And I'd be worried if anybody suggested that it were. But would it be detrimental to national defense if it's a rallying thing? But is it that rallying? I mean, like, do people seriously rally around the king? I mean, I know some people sort of post a Facebook picture, that, you know, saying, you know, God save the king or whatever. But I, I don't think it, people are rallied in the sense that they like, they think it's like quite, quite nice and quaint and they like having a little sort of garden party to celebrate the coronation of the king. People don't seriously think that they would like die for this man. I mean, maybe, maybe they do. I'm sure some people do, but I, I, just, I, I just sort of don't buy it. But isn't that because we've had no war on home soil for a record amount of time? But if that happened, God forbid, then the rallying point would be more effective. That could be true, but I think uh, other countries in similar situations throughout history have managed to do so by rallying people around flag by rallying people around the concept of the nation by rallying people. and in fact when you rally people around something like an idea rather than a person i think that the the rallying can be even more effective because you're not expected to uh, put yourself on the line and and unambiguously declare your willingness to die for a fallible human being but rather an idea that sort of exists and sits above us all which is what the monarchy is supposed to be it just isn't anymore because nobody believes it. Nobody watches that t TV channel, sees the king walking down this aisle with his silly robes on and thinks, yeah, yeah, I, I, I actually think that this man is a special man chosen by God to sit above the rest of us, to embody some sort of mythical ethos of the nation. It's just not how people see it anymore. So M, and we've already covered this, but if you could just give a little summary, because we're near, nearing the end. M doesn't understand why the monarchy would need replacing. That's a, that's a wonderful question and, uh, well, a wonderful point with three question marks after it. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's essentially what I started with, which is that it, it, <laughs> the fact that the monarchy, it seems so like, oh, why do we even need to do it? Like, what would it change? Is kind of an argument in favor of getting rid of the monarchy. Because the, the whole point is that they're just this strange vestige that just sort of sits, it sort of attaches itself to British society and British culture. And yet still manages to command, you know, the, the, the weekly influence of the prime minister and the legal and tax exemptions that I was talking about earlier. You're quite right. Like, it, it's not so much that it needs replacing. It's, it's a bit of an insult to our principles of democracy and to the fact that the rest of us have to pay, you know, a significant portion of our pay slips, no matter what we're earning above the personal allowance. And they don't. I think, you know, s screw that, in other words. So Jane's added a little bit about the, the military side of it. This is how our army and fighting force works to die for king and country. I think these days emphasis on the country point. It's, 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 it's the long and short of it. I'm afraid to say, I, just, I, I, I think king and country is a phrase which has essentially just come to mean country. It's, it's what we're talking about. Like the king himself, would you die for Charles? Would you, would you take a bullet for Charles? I mean, I don't think I would. I mean, not, not to, uh, no, at least not to any more extent than I would take the bullet for another stranger. But isn't that just a rallying cry to protect, you know, the entire country for king and country? It's just, uh, obviously none of us would take a bullet for Charles, but if we were being invaded by a, a foreign uh, force, we might be out, you know, chanting these things while trying to protect our loved ones. Well, if I were ever to take up arms against an enemy on our soil, it might be in defense of the country, it might be in defense of my family, it might be in defense of our uh, tradition, but it wouldn't be in defense of King Charles. And so if people want to shout that, fine. If they actually mean for king and country, I simply disagree with them. But I think what they really mean is for country. It's a bit so of a like redundancy. A in other words you're saying it's an anachronism you like a revised version for you know what your scenario is 
I, I don't know if you're describing the phrase king and country or the monarchy itself, but it applies to both. <laughs> <laughs> you're a brilliant eraser, Alex. Uh, we've got to finish now. Can you tell the viewers, the half of the viewers who liked what you said, where they can find you and support you, please? And, and the other half can More stalk you. Uh, yeah, I'm more interested in telling the people that don't like me where to find me. Uh, they, can, they can listen to more. Um, you can just type in Alex O'Connor onto, onto YouTube and it should come up. I have a podcast called Within Reason available on all podcasting platforms and you can find me there too.